Well, hello and welcome to a book. Once again, I am so excited that you are here. I want to tell you a little bit about this past season of a book. We have had some of the most amazing authors on, and this is the last week of interviews for season one of a book. And I am thrilled to tell you that wrapping up this week, we have another fantastic author who isn't just a great author, he's a great person. And I'm really excited to introduce you to Jamie Sandlam. But before I bring him on, I want to remind you to please hit that like and subscribe button. Because when you subscribe to this channel, it helps out our authors. Well, Jamie, welcome to today's show. I'm so excited for you to be here. Oh, I'm excited too. Thank you for having me. Ah, oh, this is just a thrill. This is exciting. So before the show, we were talking a little bit about Taekwondo of all things. And <laughs> yes. that got me really very curious to know a little bit more about you. So would you mind telling the audience a little about yourself? Sure. So I, I live in Canton, Michigan, um, grew up in Southeast Michigan, went to school here. Uh, I, I say that I am a mathematician by training, a web developer by profession, and a writer and martial artist by by um, passion. Oh. So I I my bachelor's of science I, I don't use any of it, but it's I have that in math and computer science. Uh, I my day job is programming, and um, it's taekwondo and writing that takes up all of my off time. So I'm also a cat dad. Actually, today is my youngest <laughs> fourth birthday. Oh, <laughs> how exciting. <laughs> okay, so it sounds like you have your hand in many things. You're a busy guy. When mm -hmm. do you find time to write? I, I used to uh, get up an hour early to write. I, I write late. Uh, I While driving is a great time to work on dialogue. Uh, while in the shower is a great time to think up all the best scenes and dialogue, and then you can immediately forget it by the time you get to a computer. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's all those little spare moments. Um, that I just find time to to put down a couple ideas or you know, work a little bit more on a chapter that I had in mind. Wow, yeah, I don't I don't find much time these days to write. So mm -hmm. we're going to be wrapping up. You heard me say we're going to be wrapping up season one this week. I mm -hmm. have one more one more podcast to do tomorrow, and that will end season one until this fall. And so I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to being in the off season where I can get some writing done because right now I just haven't had time. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Writing yeah. does take time. And and I, I hear what you're saying. You come up with these really great ideas. And for me, it's usually right about the time I'm ready to fall asleep. Oh, I want to put that in the <laughs> yes. book. You know, I want to put that in my mm -hmm. story. And then by the time I wake up, it's either I'm too busy or I've completely forgotten <laughs> what it was. Oh, yeah. So I find yeah. myself sometimes getting up in the middle of the night and sort of texting myself these ideas. Do you ever do that? Smart. Yes. I I wish I did. It's usually while I'm driving, I'll I'll be talking as the characters and doing all the voices and coming up with some, in, in what my mind is, amazing dialogue and scene yeah. descriptions and everything. And I'm like, wow, this is this is A plus stuff. And but I don't want to fiddle with my phone and get like the the, the voice recorder out. And then I, I I get home and I sit down to write it and it's, like, it's not at all how I remember <laughs> it being. It's <laughs> like what was that? I don't remember. Yeah, that. it no. sounded great in the car. I know it sounded great in the car. Oh, but I'm sure it still <laughs> sounds great once you get it out on paper. I'm sure I, it's fantastic. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So when you do sit down to write, what mm -hmm. is your writing process like? So my my first mm -hmm. book, um, which I published back in uh, fall of 2020, I just pantsed the whole thing. I had I didn't know and much at all about what the writing process looked like or how you should plan a book. So I just had an idea for a story and I just love these characters and they let the characters do what they wanted to do. And they just totally, they just ran amok over everything. And it ended up with something that was mostly usable. Um, but then I had a developmental editor take a look at it and she said, yeah, it's nice until it gets about halfway through and then it all kind of falls apart. So oh. I ripped out the back half of the book, redid it. And now I plan my books. Um, so the, the last two standalone novels actually were planned start to finish. Every single scene, I knew exactly what major plot points had to happen. If a character, like their developmental arc was changing in some way, what major things had to happen in each scene. And I had those all beautifully mapped out on a Trello board, which is Trello's just a website for doing uh, like whiteboarding. So I had that, I had that all totally planned out for the last two, two novels. And 
that ends up generating a lot less re-editing needed or a lot less mm -hmm. waste. So I've gone from being a total pantser to a total plotter. Yeah. <laughs> but there's still a lot of times when if you plan stuff too much, the characters will the characters will come in and ruin your day still. And you you have to let them do what they're gonna do and and take you off the rails a little bit and hopefully you can find a way to bring it back. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> and just recently, I think it was, May, well, I say recently, recently in my world, so it was about a month ago, <laughs> I sat mm -hmm. down and knocked out, I did have time to sit down and knock out a couple chapters of a book that I'm sure. working on. Oh, nice. And I had this whole plan in my head of the direction that this particular chapter was going to go. And as I'm writing, it just didn't get there. I couldn't get it there. So it took on this life of its own. And I, I'm not so sure that I'm disappointed. I sort of like where it went. Right. <laughs> but I, after rethinking it, when I go in to edit, I think I'm, I'm going to have to change some things just for continuity for the rest of the story. But okay. it's interesting how that can happen. You know, oh, yeah. like you said, the characters themselves sort of dictate the path the story goes <laughs> there there was a, a part towards the end of uh, my third book in my trilogy where i knew what was going to happen the characters were doing all this this stuff messing with timelines and whatever and the one character says well why don't we do this and i said oh that is a great idea and that will actually uh, ruin all of my plans but there was no reason why the character wouldn't suggest doing that so i had to let them suggest it and then i had to stop and set it aside for a moment and figure out why they couldn't do that uh, the last novel, there was a couple spots where the something would trigger a thought in the main character's mind, and she says, oh, I have an idea. But I would have no idea what the idea was. So <laughs> I would actually have to set aside. and <laughs> Because the character just had a different intelligence than I do, so yeah. she just thinks very differently. And I always feel a little insane saying that, because these characters only exist yeah. in my brain. But yeah. but no, that's, that's but how They it really is. do. Well, you know, and they don't just take a life of of their own on for the writer. They do for the reader. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. So yeah. when somebody reads your book, there those characters are very important to them. I, mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. I've asked a few authors this. Let me ask you something. When yeah. you're done with a book, do you miss the characters? Uh, I do. Um, so it, back to the last novel again. There was a, a scene where, or there was a, I think four chapters where one of the characters went away. He just had to, he was off screen for a bit. When he came back, I was like, oh, yay, he's back. I was so excited. Like I wrote him out and then I was so excited when he came back. And yeah, so I, I was happy to see him return. And uh, now I'm actually working on a plotting out a uh, continuation of my trilogy. And so it's going back to the characters who, who successfully made it through the trilogy and just getting back into their mindsets and their world. And I'm like, oh, this is just like a warm hug the whole yes, thing because yes. I just love all these characters and the settings and and the magic system and and mm -hmm. just getting back to that. Oh, I, I haven't touched this in two years and getting back oh. to it. I love it. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I miss them when helping... they're gone and I'm happy to see them again. Oh, I was helping a friend of mine recently. We we help each other, right? And I was helping her mm -hmm. with a, a book that she was doing. This uh, the one she just came out with one last week, but the one before it, I was helping her with and. I, not to take credit for her work, but I was the one who gave her the idea. If she's out there listening, Ooh. I gave you the idea <laughs> anyway for this book and teased her about some of the characters that she should put in there. And I found myself genuinely missing her characters. She mm. developed them. She did all of the writing, but I was such a part of it that I genuinely missed it. I said, you Aww. really need to come out with a sequel, which she didn't. <laughs> and I don't think she's going to, but it was Aww. a standalone novel. But yeah, it's amazing how we can get so wrapped up in in these ideas. Are any of your characters similar to you? Do they have any of your persona? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, my two books ago, um, Arcanum, the, it was my first standalone novel. The main character in it is... He's 19 and he's more or less how I was at 19. So he's he's a, a he's noble born and has um you know lives in a manor by himself. So that part is not me, but a lot of his, <laughs> his shyness and and um introverted uh oh. behaviors, a lot of that was me. Oh right. And from you, the don't, trilogy, you don't strike uh, me as a shy kind of person. Oh, so doing doing all this right here, this is what has has really forced me out of my shell. Uh, I absolutely very much enjoy just staying home. Like last, I was sick last week and I, I didn't leave the house for like a week and a half and it was fine. 
<laughs> you were okay with that, huh? <laughs> Very much. Yeah, so I was introvert. totally fine with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally an introvert. But doing, I do a lot of book shows now, so I am standing behind a table, talking to, trying to engage every single person that comes by, and that has really ripped me out of my shell. I, it has forced me to be not shy. Yeah. Yeah, life as a writer has a way of doing that, doesn't it? I think a lot <laughs> oh, yeah. of people think they're going to write a book, they write the end, and that's the end, and it's just the mm. beginning. That's just the oh, start. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, what, what's been your favorite part of the journey then? Oh, I think, um, so I, I was just working on, or just finished up the the second edition for my first book, and oh. it's it's like a lot of things. when When you see it every day, you don't see your own progression and you don't see how you're improving because you, you see yourself every day. It's like, if you're, you know, if you're it's the same thing, if you were to be going to the gym and you don't see your weight loss because you see it incrementally all the time, same thing with getting better as a writer, you don't notice it because you're just slowly getting better. And so going back to the first book and wow, okay, I have improved. And just being able to, I, I wasn't going to completely rewrite everything based on however I would write it now, but, being able to to clean some stuff up and being able to see how much I came. So I think that just seeing the growth is, is so neat. And then um, oh, I would say even more than that, that was uh, when I'm at these shows and people come up to me saying that they want to write a book and they say, Oh, I don't know if I can, I don't blah, 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 whatever their excuses are. And I say, please do it. Please, please, please. Everyone has a book in them. And I would absolutely love for everyone to go through that process to try to draw a book out of themselves because it's it's difficult to do it's a challenge and i'm not doing it i wouldn't don't suggest it and promote people to write a book because i'm like oh i wrote a whole bunch and so you can too no it's it's that it is it's so much of your person that you put on the page and how difficult that can be and it just you will be changed from it so yes getting, getting love... especially young people to say yes yes that you just summed up this entire season of this show and what our message has <laughs> been and the message is you can write a book anybody can you write can. a book and i i that just resonates with me so much because i believe what you said everybody has a book inside of them and i get it yes. there are people out there who maybe don't have the the technical writing skills but in this day and age there are so many ways to overcome that and your oh, yeah. story can be heard it can be yes. heard you know we have there's well, shoot, Grammarly, there there are editors out there who would be happy oh, to yeah. tear your book apart for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Give you a better way to go. But but no, I, <laughs> I, all joking aside, seriously, I believe everybody has a story, even if it's not oh, yeah. a fiction story. Yes. My first my first seven books were nonfiction. Six yeah. books. Six books right. were nonfiction. Yeah, I hadn't written fiction, but I believe everybody has something worth writing. And there is sure. nothing else in the world that will preserve your legacy than something you've written. Yeah. Even if it's just uh, poetry. My mother. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, my, my mother, uh, she's um, she's 68. She, since the 70s, has been very much um, obsessed with a family cemetery in Kentucky. It's right on, it's in, on the border of Kentucky and Indiana. So it's a like Civil War era cemetery. And she's done all the genealogy research. She's gone so many times over decades to get pictures for it. Wow. I just helped her to compile a 170 page book about the cemetery and the people in it. And so she just on Sunday, just, just yesterday, uh, just got her first proof of it, full color, premium color. It's absolutely beautiful. So oh, where she's going to be real close to to be to be publishing on uh, on this. So yeah, it's not a fiction book, but it is something that she has put a lot of you know over forty years of time into. Everyone wow. has a book in them, whatever Everybody. that book is, even if it's yeah, yeah. You spent something... all your life doing something. Right about it. You know, and, and for some people, it might be a cookbook. Oh yeah, uh, you. Yep. It, uh, Answer this for me. The very mm -hmm. first book that you ever got published, what was that feeling like? Oh my when I when I opened up the mail and I saw my name, I got the, the book with, with my name on it and it's full of the words that I wrote. I cried. I broke down and cried. Mm -hmm. Um it was yeah, I self-published. So um some people look down on self-publishing because you know anyone can do it, da, da, da. whatever. I, I wrote those words and then I have I now I have a physical book full of those words yes. and yeah and yeah. still now every time i get that first mm -hmm. proof of the next book 
I it's it doesn't quite hit me as strong as the first one, but it still it takes me back. Yeah, it just you know, I, I know. Me away from just a moment. There is nothing like that moment where you say, "I did this. I I created yeah. this. These were my thoughts, yes. and now my thoughts are out there for other people in in a book." Yes. You know how we all grew <laughs> up having to read books in school, yes. and we read and we're always reading other people's words. So to get that and say, wow, I did that. Now I want to tell you, my first book was garbage. I may, I oh. am not at all shy about that. I'm real honest about mm. that. It was terrible. I had no clue as to what I was doing. I had never set out to be a writer. My <laughs> business coach said, if you want to get more speaking engagements, you need to write a book. So that's what I did. Oh. I had no clue okay. as to what I was going to write about. I didn't think I had a book in me. I, it just wasn't. So I rapidly wrote this stupid little book. It's called A Squirrel Peed on Me. It's <laughs> And it's a true story that I use as an analogy throughout the book on how to deal with people in your life and situations. And it was it was terrible. Not only was th there just wasn't much direction in the book. It was just it was garbage. <laughs> but um, it's a funny little story. I mean, there's some good parts in it. Don't get me wrong. But I had mistakes. I had grammar mistakes i had i have a typo mm -hmm. in the book i have never gone back and fixed it and i'll tell you why i knew that i wasn't a writer and so i left a caveat in there at the very start of the book i said mm -hmm. look i'm not a writer and there will be errors in this book if you can get through a poorly written text message in a day and age of lol and brb and mm -hmm poorly written emails and still function in life, you can get through this book. And so I yeah. laid it out there. I said, this is, <laughs> but when I got the book in the mail and it came and it's just a small little book, it was the sh smallest book I've written. There was something about that moment that you just cannot describe that moment. And I want other people to have that, but I yes. will say, we talked before the show about learning from mistakes and I learned a mm -hmm. lot from those mistakes. I said, never again will I put out a book that is that embarrassing. But what I did learn is that I can do it, that I did yes. have a book in me. And the next time that I wrote, I really, I honestly had something to say, and it was one of my best, best writings. And it was a great book. It's a wonderful book. I think it's sitting right behind me. Um, and I was so, I was just as, I was proud of that one. But that feeling, you know, that very first time that you get that book in your hand for the first time, I, I would say I was just as excited each time, but it, there was still something a little bit different because at that point I knew I could do it. It was right. still thrilling, but I knew I could do it. And there was a difference. But I right. tell everybody, I want everybody to have that feeling. Yeah. <laughs> it It's hard to describe because it, you, can, you can write a book and you can keep it as a, as a Google Doc on in your your drive or you know a word doc sitting on your desktop and you say i, I wrote a book it's right there but then to have the physical mm -hmm. the physical thing in your hands it makes yes. such a difference and it's i think it does and it it's even different than kindle so i remember when it oh, came yeah. out on kindle i was like oh that's cool but it wasn't that yeah. same you know feeling that you're talking about awesome oh yeah so when you go to these book signings and people say to you oh how did you do that i want to do that what do you tell them I tell them that I, I just decided I wanted to write a book, so I wrote the story. I, I'll talk about um, the editing process to them and you know, going through different levels of uh, your, your elf and your beta readers and arc readers and, and editors. And there's a lot of work to it, but if you just have the story in mind, you just you know, make sure it's properly structured and, and, and just do it. Yeah, uh, just there's, do it. They, they say the number of people that want to write a book versus the number that actually do write a book. I compare it a bit to, um, so uh, um, take a quick step back. So I, I decided to write my first book when I was getting ready to test for my first degree black belt. I, wow. I had trained in Taekwondo back in the late 90s and then I, um, I took over 17 years off and I decided, well, I need to get out of the house. I work from home, I need to get out of the house. So I started back with my Taekwondo training in my mid thirties. And when I was getting close to the black belt, I said, this, this is this is a thing I've wanted to do my whole life, apparently, is test for black belt. What else did I want to do? Oh, I want to write a book. So I sat down to write the book then because that was something else I wanted to check off of my, my bucket list, I guess. So the number of people that say that they want to write a book versus actually do versus 
publish, you know, there's a, a steep drop off at each of those. It's the same as the number of people that start a martial art training versus do their first belt versus mm -hmm. they drop off continuously until they get up to black belt. So I've done two of those things that, that a lot of people say they want to do or start doing, but uh -huh. don't complete. And I just want people to complete it. It's, it's such an accomplishment to be, to have the thing. Um, a lot of people drop off after black belts, just like I'm sure a lot of people write one book and they're done. This, but just, you if, know what that if reminds you don't, If you're not yeah. a writer, then just do the one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt. What What's that, that reminds me of is oh, I no, love no. to, I love watching the Olympic games. Every time the Olympic games are on, mm. I enjoy them. I particularly enjoy the winter Olympics. And I always think to myself, mm. I have never dedicated myself to something so fully that I, I reaped the rewards of that mm. except for writing. That's, the, okay, that's yeah. the only thing in my life that I, and, and I know that's not true. I have other accomplishments and I'm good at other things, but there's something about that. You know, when I look around at life and I see all of these accomplished people, my, my, we were talking earlier, my grandson with his, his black belt and, and all these people who seem to have accomplished things. And it's very easy in this life to compare ourselves to other people, whether we intend oh, to or not. But when I see that, I always think. I would love to know what it feels like to do something so passionately that I, that I have that reward at the end. And for yes. me, it's been writing. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I will That's ever, wonderful. I will ever, ever participate other than a spectator in Taekwondo. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this is what I have. So you taught, you touched very briefly. You said you tell people you talk to them about editing and the editing process. Yes. What, what is your editing process like? And by the way, before we go too much dive too deep into that, I do want to echo something you said. I'm a big proponent of self-publishing. I believe that we no longer live in a day and age where we have to ask permission to write a book. We uh, used to, you. right? Yes. When you used to write yes. a book, you had to send it off to the publisher and company and hope and pray that they liked it well enough to pick you up. And that's the only way people were able to get books printed, you know, and mm -hmm. seen. But that's not like that anymore. There are so many tools out there for self-publishing. Yes. And I know that some people think, oh, they're, you know, self-publishing, how good could it possibly be? Hey, let me tell you, they're excellent. They are excellent. And people are choosing to self-publish for far other reasons than because their book might be rejected somewhere. They're self-publishing because it actually brings them more money and they mm -hmm. have there's so many more benefits. You have complete control over your manuscript when you self-publish. Yes. So I'm a big proponent of that. There are editors out there you can hire just like you did. There, are, There's Grammarly. There's just tools that they did not have, you know, 20 years ago even. So oh, sure. I'm glad that or you brought that up. Even five years ago. Even five years. No kidding. It's just, mm -hmm. it's gotten so, so much better. So much sure. better. And that, that lousy reputation is just, it's going away. Mm -hmm. So, so let's talk about your editing process. So if I could touch really quickly on um, traditionally published, um, sure. other than, my other thought on that is that a lot of it is trying to time what the market will be like in three years because mm. you write your book. You sell it to your, you get your agent to, to try to sell it. And then they try to, or try to sell it to someone. And then you have to know what the market will be like in, in years. So you're not writing what you necessarily want to write, but you write what you think will sell in years from now. Mm -hmm. That's also my thought on traditionally published and from having talked to people in, in the industry. Yeah. Um, but uh, but anyway, so yes, uh, yeah, my editing process. So I I generally will write the full draft and it, the with Arcanum and Grave, Grave Mistakes, my last two standalone novels, uh, I just kind of slammed through the drafts. I just, I wrote whatever was coming to mind. I actually used a um, a little word processor that had no editing software on it. You know, it didn't have any little red squiggles under mis <laughs> misspelled things and, oh. and no anything. So I just wrote, wrote, wrote. And once I got all the scenes in, that's when I imported them into, um, I believe I used uh, Scrivener first to kind of read through and kind of reorganize things within Scrivener. There's so many different tools and, and yeah. yeah, everything. It's not, it's not cheap because there's so many tools and they all do their own little thing. Uh, and then eventually using like Grammarly is, is wonderful for finding all those grammar issues and um, helping to find sentences that are weirdly edited or, you know, sound weird, but you don't really notice it until you say them out loud. So, so I'll write it. I will make sure that everything matches up with, with my plans for it. Uh, I will re-edit based on um, making sure that I, I hit all the points, all those points in my in my uh, 
scene list. And then when it gets down to actually editing, I will give it to an alpha reader who will is uh, usually my husband is the first one to read anything. So um, he reads it and says yes or no on different things. And, and then I, uh, I have a couple other writer friends and I have to give it to them. And they tell me what they think on it. And they'll, they might give me line edits or they might not. Uh, at some point, I say that this is now getting into beta out of alpha. So just like software. And uh, I will hire people or find people off of uh, other Facebook groups, um, other friends that will be in the beta uh, group. And that's, that I always have to do in waves. You only want like two or three people to read it at a time because if you have if you have 18 people read draft two and they all come back with the same thing, you can't expect any of these people to read draft three then because it's right. not going to be different enough. So it's just a lot of making iterations over and over. You reread the book 80 times yourself oh. as you're re-editing and re-editing and making notes to make sure that you don't have, you know, say somebody's eye color is green here and then it's red over here. And, mm. and it is yeah. so easy to do that. It is oh, so easy to so do easy. that. So yeah. easy. I have found that uh, one tool that I have uh, now that I just said that five years ago we we didn't have the same tools is um, is generative AI art. So I can just say, make me a character that looks like this. And then here's the character. And uh, I, I'm not going to publish anything with, with AI art. I, I hire people to do my art. But when I'm just going for concept stuff, it's wonderful to be able to say, this is what the character looks like. And then yes. now I have a picture of them. And it's exactly how the character, how I want them to look. And then I can reference that. This is what the hair looks like. This is the color of... of this and that of them. Um, so that actually helps with the editing a, a lot as well. You, so you talk it's about a lot the... of iterations for editing. I, sorry, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I thought you were done. <laughs> no, go ahead. A lot of. Re- oh, no, no, no. I, oh, no. I, 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 yeah, so it's a lot of iterations. And, and then eventually you get to a part where uh, you get more and more beta readers. Each round of beta readers will have either less to say or they'll have more nebulous things to say or things that are not really actionable and at that point i think well nobody's complaining about the book so i guess it's done <laughs> that's when it's, you know it, I, what, I, isn't it they they say that you'll write your original draft once but you'll rewrite your book something like 13 times i can't remember what the actual number is before oh, it goes it. to publishing yeah mm-hmm. yeah so it's a lot i have I mean, one writer friend that every time she starts a new draft Every time she starts a new draft, she actually starts with a brand new empty document and oh, starts no. to rewrite the story. No, 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 <laughs> that, no. That I won't do. Yeah. I not cannot do that. You touched on two yeah. things that I want to circle back to. Sure. One of those was you talked about finding somebody in a Facebook group. I think groups yeah. are so important. Writers groups, whether that's in person, if you're fortunate enough mm-hmm. to live somewhere where they have writers groups or on Facebook or anywhere else that you can be a part of an online community where people are sharing their stories with one another to get that feedback. Feedback is so important. Yes. I, mean, yes. I actually yes. truly believe that. I think for me, when I first started writing, there was a little bit of fear of feedback. We all have a fear of mm. being rejected. It's like, oh, yes. I don't know if I want to share my private thoughts <laughs> with somebody else and have exactly. them say, well, you need to change this. Like, I don't want to change my thoughts, you know, <laughs> but good writers really good writers understand that it isn't personal, that if they want to get better, then they need to do exactly what you just talked about. And that is to share their writing. I always say, get at least, at least three sets of eyeballs on that before you put it out there. Oh, sure. Because what makes sense to, and and not necessarily your best friend or your grandma, (laughs) who's going to tell you, oh, it's so wonderful. I can't believe you wrote that, you know. Oh, yeah. And and it is. It's wonderful. That's all great. But we need somebody else to look at it and say, mm, you might consider. Right? Yes, absolutely. I think that's important. The other thing you touched on was AI. And um, I know that is such a controversial topic right now. We did an episode with uh, Michael uh, Woodenberg, and we talked about AI and the use of AI as a tool in writing. And it is, I love mm-hmm. what you said about coming. I hadn't thought about using it for the visual, because I think if I had my, that my characters visually in front of me, it would actually help me not make some of those mistakes. Like you talked about the different eye color um, or height, or I remember my friend helping me with my book. She said, I didn't know he had curly hair. When did you tell me he had curly hair? (laughs) 
you know, that kind of thing. So that would have really helped. That's a, that's a tool. Mm -hmm. That's a tool. I'm not yes. saying that AI Absolutely. can, is not going to replace <laughs> the human writer, yeah. but I will tell you this. My husband is currently writing a book using AI as a tool because he does not have, first off, he doesn't have time. He's working full time. He doesn't have the physical time to sit down and write. And secondly, he, he struggles a little bit with, you know, like literature, not, not reading. That's not right. Just sentence structure. <laughs> you sure. know, he struggles a little bit with some of that stuff. I think there's maybe a little dyslexia and stuff. So what he can do, though, is he can put that his all of his story ideas and his thoughts into a language based AI program. It spits out some ideas. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of them. He's like, that's not what I was thinking. That's not <laughs> what I wanted. But when it gives him some parameters that he can work with and he can put it into the document and go back and edit through that or have mm -hmm. somebody yes. like myself help him with that. I don't have time to, to do it all for him, but certainly it's a wonderful tool. And I know there are people who are afraid of AI taking over and replacing. But I want to tell you, there was a time when people were afraid of hammers and they used to use rocks yes. to put nails <laughs> into things, right? And mm -hmm. then they said, oh, there's a better tool. I think yes. about the guy putting the roof on the house and mm -hmm. he, here he was hammering, right? One nail at a time. And then mm -hmm. realized I could be using an uh, air, what are the air gun, right? Like an air compressor, yeah. Air compressor. Sure. Thank you. I couldn't think of the word mm -hmm. air compressor and boy, knock these roofs out a whole lot faster. Oh yeah. And that's oh, really yeah. what AI is intended for. It's just a tool. It's just a tool, yes. I think, to help speed up some processes. And when you think about it, really Google is, is AI. It is. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a lower form of it. So I am not opposed to AI. I oh. think that there are some wonderful functions for it used in properly and in the right context. So, yes. Yeah. There are people that are generating entire books with AI. And no, I, I, I wouldn't want to read something that doesn't have that a person didn't write, but they're wonderful for generating ideas. I actually put I, uh, the back blurb for the first two of my books of short stories uh, they have 18 and 20 or 18 to 20 short stories in them. So they're, they're wow. all over the place in genres and everything. So I, I put the back blurb of those two into chat GPT. And I said, Hey, uh, the third book is uh, largely about vampires. So using the, the, the blurb for these two books, write the blurb for the third that is about vampires. And it actually ended up giving me some great, great um, ideas, writing prompts. Yeah, yeah. Like, Oh, vampire speed dating. Yes, of course. <laughs> I want to write about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that, that's interesting that you say that because as when we're done with this interview, I have to edit it. I have to publish it, right? Mm -hmm. All the things that I have to do sure. to get it up onto my platforms. And sometimes coming up with descriptions for the videos can be a little bit of a challenge mm -hmm. for me. So I will put that into chat GPT, just like you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it usually spits out a pretty decent description. And then I can yeah. change it as needed. I know sometimes it's, it misses the mark and it's really based on what I put in there, but it misses the mark. It's like, oh, it's not quite right, but it will. And it it makes it just simplifies it for me. So I can go in and say, pretty good. Now let's change a few things. The other yeah. thing that I like it for, because YouTube is so SEO driven, search oh, engine yes. optimization, and it it um, is owned by Google. So I know that when chat GPT is giving me these descriptions, more than likely, I'm going to have some fairly good descriptive words that people are actually searching for. And that's one of the prompts mm -hmm. that I give it. So there, there's things that it can be used for. It's not a substitute by any means. And nine times no. out of 10, I have to change something. It gets something in there that's like, well, that's not quite right. You yeah. know? So, <laughs> well, you you um, edit the books and then you have to format, right? You yes. have to format the yep. book. And that to me, that is the nightmare. I hate formatting <laughs> books. But we're going to talk about that and how you go about doing that in just a moment. Right now, we're going to go hear about Victory Vision Publishing, and then we'll be back. Hey, everyone. Are you stuck trying to figure out how to finish writing or publishing your book? Well, let me tell you about Victory Vision Publishing. Victory Vision Publishing is there to help you cross that finish line. They have package plans that are tailor-made just for your individual needs. They have learning opportunities where you can discover ways of overcoming some obstacles that you might have. Adam Fleming is a wonderful CEO and they are a fully staffed team just waiting to help you edit, lay out, maybe make a cover for your book. Go ahead and join their 
email list and check out some of the wonderful books and wonderful authors that they have already helped get published. Yep, Victory Vision is definitely the way to go if you feel stuck and just want some support in getting your book out to the world. You're only one book away from changing the world. VictoryVision.org. Okay, we are back. We've been talking with Jamie Sandland, and he has been talking about the writing process, editing, and I think before we went on break, we were going to talk about the dreaded formatting. I call it the <laughs> dreaded formatting, although I've recently come came across a tool that is helping me with that, but I want to hear about your your process. Sure. So the at the first books, I... Uh, I did. I had all the manuscripts in Scrivener, and Scrivener has an, an export to Word option. So I did that, and then I tried getting Word formatting properly, and it would be such a such a pain because it would like set up sections with it, and I I did not understand what I was doing. Um, but then I have since discovered Atticus, which is um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my so, that's where I was going with that. It's like oh, I love it. <laughs> it's yes. wonderful. Yeah. So yeah, I just set up a theme for for like each of the books within the trilogy that I'm able to just import the manuscripts, say use this theme, and then it exports everything properly. It does it does all your um, you know hyphen word wrapping. It makes sure that you don't have one word on it on a page by itself. You know the orphans and and widows uh-huh. as they call them in the formatting. It makes sure that your gutter space is good. It does all, all that nice stuff. Um, so I I've actually done some formatting for a couple other authors just trying to see if it was possible if that would be something i could do as a gig and it's it's a lot of work to take someone else's uh, manuscript and oh oh, yeah yeah, yeah. even atticus is a wonderful tool and their support is great um but it's not a hundred percent and i would still recommend it highly to anyone um although it's because of the cost of it i would say if you plan on writing two books it's worth it if you're just writing the one book and you're done you could get you could pay someone to to format it but if you're going to have a couple it's it's definitely worth the price it's a wonderful tool yeah i would definitely say it is worth it if you're going to do more than one for sure Mm -hmm. and i can't wait now to get my next but to be honest with you it's one of the reasons Mm -hmm. why i dragged my feet on this last book that i am writing i'm it's my favorite book i love it it's my second fictional book that I'm writing. I wrote it for my grandkids in particular, but oh. I love the book. I'm enjoying the characters. It's going really well, but I'm dragging my feet because of that dreaded formatting. That's two <laughs> days. I mean, I would spend two days, I'm not kidding, looking for those widows and orphans that you talked about and saying, mm-hmm. how come this KDP is not accepting this? What is going <laughs> on? You know, and then having to to re reformat, reformat, oh, yeah. two days worth. Okay, and okay. I will say oh. KDP for the most part has been very helpful if I've had questions, I'm able to, when I can connect with somebody from their <laughs> customer service department, they have helped me. But Atticus was a game changer. That was a game Definitely. changer. And it's actually mm-hmm. motivating me. So I have my my friend and my editor, who's also an author, she's she's using Atticus as well. And she just published her book this week. And it she said, saved her hours, just hours oh, and yeah. hours of time. So oh, I'm yeah. looking forward to finishing now. <laughs> well, I I had my uh, my trilogy, so it's um a hundred, hundred and twenty, and so it's it's about three hundred fifty thousand words between Oof, three books. That's a lot. And I I contacted a company saying, hey, I I want to format these so that they have a consistent formatting. How much you know what? How much would it cost? And they quoted me at over seven hundred dollars for the three books. And oof, okay, um, no. <laughs> Yeah. So Atticus is less than that, but so there there are definitely services out there who will do it. But um, if you have multiple books, it's it's you want to own the tools. It, yeah. it, like you said uh, before the break, that's you know, having the proper tools is so life changing. You're not gonna it, mm-hmm. you're not going to hammer in stuff with a with a rock. You're you know if you are putting in a whole lot of screws, you get a power drill. You don't try to exactly. put it all in with yeah. uh, with a jeweler's. <laughs> Yeah, uh, tool, so. <laughs> sitting there with your fingers trying to screw <laughs> this thing in. And that's what oh, I yeah. was doing oh. when it came to formatting. <laughs> it was a nightmare. Mm-hmm. But well, Jamie, I want people to see your book. So we're going to actually oh. pull up your Amazon and give okay. people an opportunity to see them. And I want to hear all about these wonderful stories that you have written. Oh, all right. So if you're watching this on YouTube, then um, I would 
highly recommend you go over to Amazon and you search for Jamie M. Samland and you will find all of his books. But um, Those of you who are listening, I should have said, go ahead and, and go on over to Amazon and find them. We're going to leave the link to, to your um, Amazon in the description of this video. So everybody's mm -hmm. going to have an opportunity to find them. But you have written quite a few books and... I want to start with, I know Realms of Tursewood was your, and I think maybe you even have that book with you. Do you have that book? I do. With you? Yep, I have, this I have was, a big stack of books. Was this, this was the first one you wrote? Am I? This was the first, yes. Okay. All right. Fantastic. So tell us a little, I don't want you to give any spoilers away, <laughs> but tell us about the story and this particular series. So I, 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 I've come up with the the quick little elevator pitch. That's one of the things of marketing that's actually very difficult. Is you can write a hundred thousand word book, but then how do you <laughs> boil that book down to two hundred fifty words or two sentences? So um, when I'm when I'm at a show, I will point to realms realms of Tursewood. I say it's epic sword and sorcery fantasy, end of the world level stuff. They fix it, but then things get worse for the next couple books. So the the magic system is is uh, it's there's a strong magic system to the world in this, but really the stories are about the characters and how they how the world is affecting them and the other way around. So we we have two main and our two main protagonists through um, through the trilogy. We have Lone, who is he's about thirty. He's um, the reluctant leader. He's kind of um, suddenly thrust into leadership role of his country, and it, he's always wanted to just be an adventurer and just kind of go have fun. But now he is forced to be the ruler. And so it's him trying to put aside his, I hate to say childish, but his own desires in life and, and do something that is better for the whole country. And as you see through the books, is that he doesn't have much in the way of country. Um, all, all of he, um, he is the king of Draken, which is the Archmage nation. And the Archmages don't really care to to pay much attention to him they're kind of scattered around the the, con the continent and they don't really want to pay much attention to him and so he doesn't really have much to do so he uh he grows in trying to um trying to bring together the whole continent and just bring more peace and then in doing that he he awakens ancient evils and and all that so <laughs> the the second protagonist is his uh younger half sister alicia yeah, she is. Um, she's about sixteen in the book, and we we meet her. Um, she's the the princess of two different countries. She is a mixed race, um, so she's half human, half Spartus. The Spartus are kind of uh, like a dark elf sort of character, forest elves. And she's she realizes that she is actually a being of cosmic power. So it, the series is the Chronicler's Awakening, and um, she is the Chronicler. So, a little uh, bit of spoiler cool. there, but not too much. Not too much. <laughs> so and there, there, and how the, many books are in that series? So there's the trilogy, and then uh, so uh, okay. Realms of Tursewood, Trials of Thraktar, and Seeds of Farsil are the three books in that trilogy. And then also Necromancer of Urbis is kind of a prequel, kind of a book two point five. It's a it's an ancillary book to it, and that's the antagonist from the second book, Trials of Thraktar. You get his backstory here. Okay. And he's not a very he's not a very nice guy, and he's very selfish. But it was fun to write him because um, he, I, I had just come off of writing Trials of Throctar and just all the the evil stuff he does in that book. And I'm like, I want to make another book about him, so oh. I did. Um, <laughs> and actually, this book I uh, it was um, like late October of 2021. I didn't know that NaNoWriMo was a thing, the National Novel Writing Month. I didn't know it was a thing, and then I heard about it, and, oh, the goal is to write a 50,000-word book in the month of November. So I wrote uh, Necromancer of Urbis uh, without any plan, without knowing at all oh, where it was really? going to go. But I, I knew the main character so strongly that, that I was able to just produce it. <laughs> oh, my. Wow. So you were yeah. able to, to yeah. participate in that. That's exciting. Yeah. Yes. It was my it. first time doing it and the first time that I – succeeded in doing it now you have written some other stuff this what is this yes. ooh shiny i want to hear about this <laughs> so yeah the ooh shinies are uh this collection of well, right now i have three of them out the third one just came out um last week 
And the first one was just going to be stories about um, things I came up from writing prompts and just silly little nothing stories. So they're like one to six pages long. They're very short, very digestible. I've had a lot of people tell me that I haven't been, been able to finish a book in like 10 years, but I was able to read the first Ooh Shiny No Problem because oh, cool. they're a little bite-sized things. So the first book, um, so and I got squirrels on the covers of them because I, I have a pretty bad ADHD. So um, I say I have a squirrel brain. I'm just kind of all over the place. And so the squirrel in the front there, squirrels became my mascot. And there were a number of stories in the first book that were about holidays. So I said, oh, I'll make the second one be the holiday edition one. Oh, and great. yeah, what? When I put out the first book, I also said Ushiny Volume 1, just kind of as a joke. I wasn't really planning to do more, but then I did do more. So uh, then from the second book, there were some reoccurring characters that were vampires. So I said, oh, I should do a vampire one. So the vampire oh, one, no. that Ushiny 3, <laughs> oh, just came great. out <laughs> with it. vampires. And uh, so it actually, that one is more focused. It is more about vampires. There's actually an ongoing storyline. Uh, that hits multiple stories in there. So these are just real quick, hopefully make you laugh, make you roll your eyes. Um, there's a lot of different writing styles and genres in there. There's there's murder mystery, there's fantasy, there's there's Aww. contemporary fiction, there's um, yeah, writing in first person present and third person past. And, so just so, whatever you felt right like there. writing about. That's fantastic. Exactly. I love it. Well, exactly. I like that yeah. that your second one had a squirrel on it because the book I'm writing, <laughs> the book I am currently I really hope it's done by the end of this month. I truly do. <laughs> it's called A Squirrel Peed on Izzy. And there's a picture of oh. Izzy and the squirrel on the front. Yeah. So I have something with squirrels peeing on people, apparently. Now, honestly, I, I the so. reason I came up with that title is I wanted to reclaim the title of my first book. That was so bad, but the title yes. was good. I sold a lot of right. copies based on the title. And I thought, well, I'm, I'd like to reclaim it and write something decent this time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's there what I go. did. Oh, that's fun. But, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Well, fun, fun. So yeah. all of these things that you have done, they were really just the beginning of this yes. process. The rest mm -hmm. comes when you have to market yourself. Yes. And I know we've had a, such a wonderful conversation. We got carried away with some other topics, but I did want to talk <laughs> to you a little bit about book marketing. You yeah. and I have something in common, and that is neither one of us are great. That's our probably our weak point, right? Yeah. I get the yeah. feeling oh, yeah. you can write fabulous stuff, and you do write fabulous stuff, I can tell. But when it comes to getting those books into the hands of readers that's a challenge it's a challenge for all oh, of us yes. something else you, that you talked about and i think you have an instagram right you have an instagram yes. or is that right okay, instagram and tiktok okay. yes so instagram tiktok we have there's facebook there's x there's instagram there's, there's so many places there's threads there yeah there i we Reddit could go on and, and on yeah there's so many mm -hmm. places how does a person keep up with all of that to get their voice out there? It's difficult. It's okay. really hard. You do things like this. You come on this show and, and mm -hmm. let people know you. I believe that that's probably the number one way that we can get books into people's hands is let them know the author. Because when they know the author or they feel like they know something about the author, they're more likely to want to read the book. So I'm glad that exactly. you're here today. But talk <laughs> about what marketing all of these things, your cover, um, the writing itself, the cover, the putting it out there on Reddit, for example, anywhere that you put it, all of these are marketing. They're made up of little tiny components. Tell me mm -hmm. what that's been like for you. Well, I, uh, so also going back to something that you said earlier about comparing ourselves to others, um, I have put so much effort into trying different things for marketing. I have, um, you know, I've hired different marketing firms to try to tell me, like, take a look at my blurbs and how do my blurbs look? Or take a look at the covers and you know, the first 10 pages of the book and and what can I improve? And they, they don't really ever come back with much. But then, like, I just see somebody uh, earlier today, they they were saying, oh, my my debut book, I just have, uh, I have 190 people signed up for the ARCs. I have so far 90 or 89 pre-orders. I've got, uh, I, I've got, you know, hundreds of people here and there and I, I'm doing dozens of interviews on youtube i'm like what what are you doing how 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 do you do all this <laughs> when i when i hit publish on, on my first book i thought well yeah i'm all done here i'm just gonna sit back and i'm not gonna be able to cash those checks fast enough they're gonna come in <laughs> no that that isn't uh, how it is 
Um, and like when I do shows, in-person shows, which those are critical, absolutely critical to actually meet readers. And, and at those, you're not really selling your books, you're selling yourself and trying to get people to know who you are. And then they say, I, I like you, I'm going to look into you. Um, so I always like to, um, like my, my bookmarks and stuff, I'm not plastering it with, with pictures of my books. I, my, the ones I give away the most, I just have the squirrels from the shiny books and, and it's just the squirrel on the front. And then it has a little QR code on the back. So it's just something, something they'll see the squirrel. They'll remember me. And then hopefully that will trigger them to, to click the link on the back. But, uh, yeah, I've done so many different things for marketing, um, Instagram um, has been off and on okay. I haven't gotten into Reddit at all. Uh, I haven't done anything on X or Threads, which I I don't know. And that TikTok was okay, but something is is going on with my accounts. I was doing re had really good uh, momentum on TikTok, but um, something's going on with my accounts, and they won't help me with support. So oh boy, complaints there. But <laughs> uh. but yeah, then. Um, getting onto Facebook groups and the problem with those is that then you have to be very active in these groups and and yes, you should be active. You should get to know all of these these other authors because if you want people to support you, you should support other people as well. But it's, it's a whole job on itself. It, it really is. So, and, and I want to make a yeah. distinction here because it is so important to be a part of a group, whether like I said, a writing group in your community that you live in mm -hmm. or or Facebook, I think that's how you and I actually got connected was through a group. Mm -hmm. But yes. there is a difference between a writer's group and getting your book in front of readers. Those yes. are sometimes yes. two very different people. Mm -hmm. Writers, writers, although we, we really do need to be readers if we're going to be writers, sometimes we don't have time. We don't have time to read no, other no. people's books. And so I feel like um, while it is important, it is not the key element to marketing a book. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so much of my my messaging that I do on, on TikTok and, and Instagram is I would like to share my story of, of how I've come in publishing and the things I've learned and the things I've done wrong. So that is something that speaks to other writers. That's not something that necessarily speaks to readers. So I that is my downfall downside i think or um, downfall is i i speak to others like me not necessarily to readers so marketing talk to readers not writers yeah we had <laughs> we had uh jody sperling on a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago and jody is a great author but he is also in my opinion certainly one of the the best book marketers that i have met to date mm. and jody has sold thousands upon thousands tens of thousands of books and he's really dialed in on this the seos the search engine optimization for amazon so when he puts his books out there he will spend days not a couple of hours not a few minutes but days researching the the correct words to use for his um book description mm -hmm. and it was so fascinating to me we pulled up one of his books much like i do for all of the authors that are on this show we pulled up one of his books to see and i noticed his description was two sentences two good sentences yeah. and they has it it did represent the book but it had such good descriptive words in there so if you think about it nobody is getting on amazon to search for your book title because they don't know it exists so yes. what are they yep. searching for? Are they searching for squirrels? Hmm. Are they searching for it? So some of his keywords that I, I remember off the top of my head was like marriage. Hmm. A lot of people might go hmm. searching for a book on marriage, right? Sure. A self-help sure. book or whatever. So he had all of these key words so that when people put those in, maybe they want a book about vampires. So they might put in vampires, but he was very intentional with the words and he kept that description very very short mm. and it was fascinating to me and he's really he's he does such a good job he has his own podcast we'll we'll share all of that too um that where people can go and learn a little bit about the marketing process from him so he's yeah i am by no means <laughs> an expert on marketing <laughs> I, I like that you said that that you shared that because I think too many people just like yourself have this idea that they're going to write a book and sit back and wait for the checks to come in. And where did we get that idea? 
We got that from books. We got yeah. that from movies. We got that from this, the, you know, culture that's glamorized writers and authors. Sure. It's, oh, he's a famous author. She's a famous author. And, oh, well, sure. Maybe one or two people end up <laughs> with that fame. <laughs> um, I didn't write Harry Potter, so that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> right. but and so much of it is a lottery it's it you, just is there's some absolute yes. garbage that gets published um and oh. i oh yeah I, I won't name any names of things but there are some books that are just atrocious but they sell a billion copies and it just happens to get into just the right people's hands and mm -hmm. just the right people read and you know, talk about it and i'm not mm -hmm. saying that it can't happen it can happen for anybody it can but what I'm saying is I don't want anybody to be disillusioned. I want people yes. to write and I want them to fall in love with the <clears throat> idea that they can write a book, but I don't want them to be disillusioned and stop writing yes. as a result of that. Like they write a great book and it doesn't sell a million copies or even a hundred copies or even a thousand copies, you know, whatever their number is that they think they need to sell. And that doesn't happen. And they say, well, I must not be any good at writing. That's not that's not the case at all. We have to look at. I think there's uh, there's millions and millions of books being published <laughs> all the time, and mm -hmm. sifting through the noise of all of the other publications is, is a true challenge. It it is, it is a full time job, and it Absolutely. takes a lot of time to get traction. There are people who wrote books ten years ago that are just now getting traction on those oh, yeah. books because they've ha and they've had to work at it and work at it. So I just mm -hmm. don't want anybody to be disillusioned if it doesn't happen for them. Again, I'm not saying it can't. It just don't think that you're going to write a book and sit back and magically, <laughs> you know, those royalty checks are going to start rolling in. Exactly. It takes work. It takes work. Mm -hmm. It can be done. I, but with like I want to say it was like 20 years um, Game of Thrones between mm -hmm. when the first one came out and before HBO picked it up for a show. I, I hadn't heard about Game of Thrones until no. it became a show. And... And then, so after watching the show, then I picked up and read the books. So, but, you know, he, he kept producing and I'm sure a lot of people read his stuff anyway, but, um, you know, he, he didn't become a household name for 20 years. Exactly. And, um, yeah, yeah so it, the, then, um, the, the, oh, I can't remember his name, but he wrote wool, the, uh, and then they picked it up on Apple TV for silo mm -hmm. and uh, he's, he's a self-published author, but he, you know, he sold, he, he did well and he, he just happens to be in that that won the lottery essentially of doing yeah. really well but you have to do it for the love of writing and you have yes. to love that process of creating the characters and the worlds and and your magic system or whatever it happens to be you can't do it thinking that this is going to be how you fund your life it's uh, I've spent a lot more money on my books than I have made on them. And <laughs> I love that but, honesty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a hobby. I'm not, I don't golf, so I'm not paying green fees. I'm spending that money on something else of a hobby. Yeah. Of and it, and what I, what I love about that is now you, yeah, you go play a game of golf and it could be great if, if that's what you're into, but it's mm -hmm. not a legacy. I mean, I suppose right. it could be for some people, but for me, <laughs> I when I when I die, I know that my grandchildren have all of these books that are going to be insights to who their grandmother was, even my yes. fiction ones, they're going to be insights to the workings of my mind. And I, I think it's a tragedy. There were things I wish I would have asked my grandmother when she was still alive. And sure. we don't think about those when we're younger, right? But there are some things that I wish I would have talked to her about and asked and stuff I just wish I would have paid attention to and known. And I'm sure my grandchildren who are so busy with their own lives are going to feel the same way someday. And now they have yes. these books that I get to leave them. I don't know. That's yes. that's my, this for me, that's personal. Everybody has a different reason why they write, but that's mine. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I I love the idea of being able to create these these characters and and just share them with other people. And mm -hmm. uh, every once in a while, you just get that little bit of a, you know, a, a quick message. A little, someone drops in your DMs and just says, hey, uh, I like this. Or you just happen. I don't, don't look at my reviews very often because I, I try not to because that, it just becomes an <laughs> obsession of, of constantly refreshing. So every once in a while, I'll look and yeah. You know, oh, somebody left a, a really nice review and, and it wasn't just a rating. It was they actually wrote stuff about it. And, yeah. That's nice. Thank you. Yeah. And it makes you want to reach out to that person and just say, thank you for reading my book. Thank you for taking that time. And what was it about the book that you liked? 
That's what what I want to ask yes. them. What was it that you liked about the book? You know, or if they really hated it, it's like, okay, well, how can I do better <laughs> next time? Or, I don't know. But I, I, we all have our own reasons for wanting to write. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jamie, this has been a fun conversation. I've enjoyed oh, I, I love your energy. You yeah, you're just so I love your energy. I love your passion. I love how fun you thank made you, this. You. And I I can't wait for people to get to read your book. I hope you well, I hope you. you become one of those lottery winners and sell millions and millions yeah. of copies of books. I, oh, I, wouldn't that be wonderful? It would be great. <laughs> buy yeah. all the toys for my cats. I, I expect you to share those royalties. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I do. I, I hope so. And I want to thank you for spending your time being with me today, Jamie, and giving up a portion of yourself because you've you've let us know a lot about you in just a very brief well, Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. Thank uh, you. Thank you. It has. And you're it's welcome. Been a, it's been a fun conversation. I appreciate it. Yes. I, one, before we go, I am going to pull up your, uh, your amp. Amazon again real quick because I do want people mm -hmm. to just have that visual just kind of get an idea these are these are Jamie's books we are going to leave the link in the description so that you can go find him and check out whichever ones interest you I, this realms of Tursewood sounds very fascinating to me and I might have to check that mm -hmm. one out so yeah yeah awesome um, and if you uh, I have everything except for the shinies is available on audiobook as well they're all professionally done so the, oh, I, I okay. especially oh, the newest that. book, Grave Mistakes, um, I especially love the work that she did on it, doing all the different accents, a lot of the, the characters and settings were Welsh based. Okay. So for, for her to have that Welsh accent for the characters was, was absolutely beautiful. Oh, who did, who did the, uh, the audio for you? Uh, Amanda Rothley. Okay. That. So right. found her on, um, just on ACX, but wow. an amazing job. Awesome. The, and who did your uh, covers? Who did your covers for your books? Oh, so the the cover art was um, was painted by uh, Martin Gresso. He's um, lives in Spain right now, but he he did the cover for Necromancer of Urbis as well, and he did a, another piece. The first piece of art that I commissioned from him, um, I haven't actually turned that into a book cover yet, oh. but or into a book rather. Um, but so he did he did Grave Mistakes and the Necromancer of Urbis. Um, grave mistakes. I um, since it's the newest one, I was able to like do some generative AI stuff to send him a concept of what I wanted. Oh, uh, but previous to that, I would send him stick figures and <laughs> like stick figures with some so with some handwritten notes. And it is amazing to have a side by side oh, of my, my little hand drawn <laughs> stuff, and and then he ends up with something beautiful like this. Oh, and, and yeah, yeah. Well, you must have more talent than I do because I can't even draw a stick figure straight. So that's out. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Canva's about the figures. best that I can do. Is I let uh, Canva do it for me. But Oh, Canva's hey, beautiful as well. Oh, yeah. You have just mm -hmm. been such a delight, Jamie. I'm so glad oh, you were here. You, <laughs> well, thank we are you. out of we are out of time. You got to hear from Jamie Samland today. And oh my goodness, go check out his books. What a what an open individual. And he just, he's just mm -hmm. so awesome. I just love it. I was so glad that he was here. So you've been watching a book. You got to hear from Jamie Samland. And I so appreciate you spending your time with us today. As always, have a wonderful day and God bless.